Hi guys, it's Scott here. In this second video on safety factors, we're going to explain to you the process for developing safety factors for your particular application. We're going to walk you through the recipe that you should use to do this. There are three main factors which contribute to our overall safety factor. The first of them is how willing are we to accept the risk of failure? So this region in the graph here where our loading can actually be bigger than the strength of our part, how big do we allow this to be? Does it have to be really small because we're really concerned about the consequences of that failure? Or can there be a significant overlap there because um, we're prepared to tolerate quite a few failures in the part that we're designing? So that's the first factor. Can it be a big overlap like this where quite a few of our parts statistically are expected to fail? Or does it need to be a smaller overlap like this, which is more reasonable, perhaps? The second factor we need to consider is how much uncertainty we have in the amount of load that's going to be applied. So what we're talking about here is the distance or the variation from our maximum predictable loading up to the end of this tail here. So what is the size of this range here? Is it going to be really big and is there going to be a lot of variation in the load or is it going to be really small uh, with minimal variation in the load? Thirdly, and finally, the uncertainty of the strength of our final part. So that is how big is this tail here on the component um, strength that we're designing for. Is there a big variation here that we should expect, or is there a smaller variation? And by com combining the uncertainty of all these three different factors, we can figure out what an appropriate safety factor is going to be for us. We do that by multiplying these factors all together to get this final FD. And so in the next step, we're going to show you how to come up with these three different factors, and we're going to give you some recommended values uh, to develop those. So the first one is consequences of failure. In cases where the failure would be very serious, then we want to have a big factor. So FO is equal to 1.4. This is for cases where people might potentially uh, be killed or injured by the failure of these devices. So that should hopefully ensure that the risk of the strength being lower than the loading condition is very small. Where failure would be serious, so potential maybe for personal injury, we would expect an FO of maybe 1.2. So a little bit more overlap tolerated. And in cases where failure would not be serious, um, which is pretty common for most of the things we design, then FO we would set to zero, so it's not actually adding anything to our safety factor. Our uncertainty in predicting our loads is formed from three factors. The first factor is the ratio by which our applied load could be greater than the one that we're designing to. So this is represented by this yellow bar here. And so depending on your application, this could be due to a number of different reasons. Say we were designing um, a car jack, it might be designed for a certain size of car, but people might use it on a heavier car than that. And so whether we want to design or allow um, some uncertainty for things like that is something that's up to the designer. The second one is the ratio by which dynamic effects might increase the load. If we take a hammer and hit something with it, then the load is going to be much greater than if we just rest the hammer on top of it. And so these uh, dynamic effects can increase the load quite significantly. The same goes for, say, a car suspension. When the car is sitting statically, um, we might know what that load is, but when we drive over a bump, uh, that load could be increased dr dramatically, and so we have to account for that in certain circumstances. The third one is the extent by which load sharing might be underestimated. So sometimes we're designing things, say if you're designing a table, you might look at a table and go, okay, well we've got four legs, so whatever load we expect uh, on top of this table, say a person standing on it, uh, worst case scenario, then maybe we would estimate that that is shared um, between all four legs equally, when in actual fact, if you've ever sat in an exam and your table is rocking around, you know that uh, a, t a table could share the load on just two legs, or if someone sat on the corner of it, maybe all of the load would be going through almost one leg exclusively, and so this is something that we have to account for.
in terms of recommended factors for our ratio by which the applied load could be greater, we want that to be somewhere between 1 and 1 1.6. If we think it needs to be any bigger than 1.6, then perhaps we haven't estimated our, our loads very accurately in the first place, and we should have a look at that in more detail. The dynamic effects, that can actually um, be quite high, so sometimes even up to three or even more in the, case, uh, in the cases where we have extreme dynamic loadings. In terms of the extent by which load sharing is underestimated, usually between 1 and 1 1.6 are factors that we would use in those circumstances. If we look now at the various uncertainties that come from the prediction of the strength of our part, we get five different factors, S1, S2, S3, S4, and S5. S1 is the inaccuracy of our material property data. So we're basing our average minimal um, predictable strength on say the average properties when that material might vary quite significantly and we haven't taken that into account. So this is where we would insert that uncertainty. S2 is the damaging effect that we might have in the manufacturing process. So we might start off with a very nice piece of steel that we know the material properties of, but we might go and weld it. And that welding process might introduce flaws, or it could actually change the material so that it's not as strong as we thought it was originally, and we need to account for that. The damaging effect of the physical environment is another one. So some of the things that we design will be used in quite severe and harsh uh, weather environments where they might be exposed uh, to water and it could potentially rust. And so we need to take uh, into account these physical environments and the effect that they're going to have on the strength of our component. The fourth one is the effect of any unquantified stress concentrations. So we might design uh, our component and ignore the effect of like sharp edges uh, or features which might generate higher than usual stress concentrations. And if we're not accounting for that, then uh, we need to put this uncertainty into our uh, safety factor. And the final factor, factor five, is how optimistic is our stress predicting model. So if this is making certain assumptions, uh, or if we know that the, the stresses might actually be higher than what we're predicting, if, if we're using a very simplified model, then we need to account for those potential differences between what we're predicting and designed to and what we might get in the real world. So for all of these five different factors, uh, we have a guideline of if uh, our estimations are conservative, we would use a 0.9. If we think that they're pretty precise, then we can use a 1, so we don't get any, any safety factor addition there. If they're pretty good, a 1.3, and if we've got a high degree of uncertainty, we might go up to 1.6. So taking the example of our peg, let's look at how we might uh, choose our safety factor to be able to calculate uh, this thickness here uh, over the fulcrum of the peg. So in terms of the risk, the failure of our peg is not going to be life-threatening, so that one can be uh, a 1. So we're not going to have an additional safety factor due to that. If it fails, maybe our washing falls off the line, but that's not a real problem um, apart from having to do our washing again. In terms of our loading conditions, what's the uncertainty of the application of these loads? Well, it may experience this loading condition where our peg is overstretched. So we might want to uh, have a factor of 1.3 there. In terms of dynamic loading, there's no significant shock loading on the peg. We're not doing it, pull it, putting it on or pulling it off really quickly that's going to actually increase the load. So that one can be a 1.0. In terms of load sharing, um, there's no real way for this peg to, to load share. We can't kind of push on one part of it more than we've otherwise accounted for. So that load sharing um, factor there would be a 1. So if we multiply all these together, the uncertainty in our loading is going to be 1.3 in total. If we turn now to the strength side of the equation, let's look at the properties of the material and say we're designing with the published material, data that's available for this particular plastic, then this is an average. If we go and um, look up a table that we're using, we might note in our table that 
the values shown for this material, the strength that we're designing to, are typical, but both higher and lower values um, may be commercially obtainable. So if we're not sure exactly what we're getting, then we may put a factor in there of, say, 1.1 to account for some variation of those material properties. If we turn now to what's going to happen during the manufacturing process, then we need to acknowledge that maybe this process could produce some local flaws if we get um, a bad injection moulding. Maybe we get some blisters or some air bubbles uh, in this moulding which could weaken it. So we're going to put a factor of 1.2 on that. In terms of the environmental conditions this peg is going to operate in, you can see in this picture here that this peg, um, in our example, has actually faded a little bit. The colour is gone from it due to um, UV light attacking it and deteriorating the plastic. So we need to consider this in um, our calculation of a safety factor, so we'll put 1.4 on that. In terms of any concentrations, then we, if we look at it here, then we do have a concentration of stresses due to this curvature of our notch. And we can actually look up some tables, um, and this is something that you'll do in future subjects to see what, what the effect of having a notch like this might be on our stress concentration, and we can read off a K value. And so we can put in a 1.1 to account for that uh, stress concentration. And then in terms of how accurately we're modelling this, how accurate is the model that we're using, we're using a, a bending model, but we need to acknowledge that it's possible um, that we could get some torsional load uh, on this if we actually apply the finger force um, not in the centre of the peg, maybe off on one corner and that could twist it up and that's going to generate additional stresses on one of the sides which may cause a little bit earlier failure. So we're going to put a factor of 1.1 on that. So we've got all of our strength side factors now and we can multiply them together. That gives us uh, a strength factor of 2.2. And if we multiply the loading factor, the strength factor, and the overall risk factor, then we get our final safety factor, which uh, for this design uh, example would be 2.9 for this peg. That's the end of the video. Thanks for watching.